recording. All righty, so thank you so much, Dr. Daisy. I'll hand it on over. Thank you, it's good to see you. Good to see you too, Crystal. <laughs> thank you for arranging this down in San Diego. It's such a nice way for us all to stay connected in some way, right? Um, so today we're talking about seaweed, and this is one of my very favorite topics to discuss anytime. It's also something that graces my dinner table uh, pretty regularly. So um, let me just give you a little bit of an introduction of how I got involved with seaweed and um, how it became so important for me in practice as well as just uh, for daily health maintenance. Um, so first of all, I want to pay a little bit of respect to um, my teacher. So this little guy in the middle sitting on the on the ground in front, that's Dr. Ryan Drum. And he was my seaweed mentor, teaching me how to harvest and really getting me involved with um, understanding how important it was uh, for human health, as well as for the health of the whole globe. And here's um, my kid, so here in this picture, here I am, I'm pregnant with this one, and that was seven years ago, but Dr. Drum and I would run these seaweed, community seaweed classes in lots of different places around the San Juans. I think this one here, we are camped out at Stony Brook Farm out on Whidbey Island in the San Juans, but we'll, we'll do it all over the place wherever there's a good seaweed bed and a place to camp and some people. So, um, Today, what I hope to discuss together is kind of to answer your questions that maybe you have, or maybe you can um, just put in the chat or let me know if you have another question in addition to this. I'm gonna blow through so much information today that I might hold the questions until the very end, uh, if that's all right with you. But please put them in the chat or please um, hang on to your question for the end. And if I don't answer it along the way, then I'm interested in what you're interested in. So today I'm wondering how we can bring seaweed into our daily lives and how we can handle um, knowing that our oceans are becoming more and more polluted and uh, how about that radioactive iodine, et cetera. So um, I love my mentor. Uh, he's, he's still around. He's an inland guy now, um, getting up there and not teaching anymore, not harvesting anymore. Um, so what Dr. Drum would say is, which side of the toilet do you drink out of? Uh, referring to our ocean just being this, this one big bowl that we all share and yet we all pollute. So which side are you drinking out of? Um, let's also talk about the advantages of seaweed. By comparison, you know, we've got a lot of healthy salts that are out there. We've got lots of supplements for our, our nutrients, especially minerals. Um, we all sing the praises of a whole foods diet. That's one of our foundational themes that we all have in common. Um, and then of course, Bot Med Club, herbal medicines. So how do we incorporate seaweed? Is it an either or, or how do they compare when we have all these choices? And which seaweeds work best for what? We might not get to cover it all, but I'm gonna do my best to um, answer a lot of these questions. So first of all, um, oh, here we are out here. These are uh, some students that sweet talked me into doing a, a little a little secret class over the summer. You see how spaced apart we are? That was mid pandemic when we weren't allowed to do any formal classes, but we all coincidentally showed up in the same beach at the same time and ended up doing a wonderful harvest and, and really having a great time. So um, in order to benefit, you gotta eat it, you gotta get it. I mean, sure, you can bathe in it, you can put it in your skin creams and such, and that's great too. But in order to truly get all of the robust benefits from seaweed, you not only have to eat it, but you need to eat it pretty often. So if you try to extract it in a tincture, I see a lot of um, fucus tinctures, bladder rack tinctures out there for thyroid health, you're not representing the complexity of the plant. And I'm gonna be um, a total bummer about that today because not only is it hard to extract with alcohol? It's hard to extract with just water too. So extractions don't necessarily get all of the complex polysaccharides and the minerals and the vitamins and the proteins and guess what? The hormones and other compounds. So really eating it is the way to go. Your gut flora need to adapt to digesting those very unique fibers. So 
usually four months is when you optimize your microbiome into being able to really truly break it all down to absorb everything. Does that mean you won't get benefits before four months? Well, no, you're gonna get plenty of benefits before four months, but that's when you can fully achieve um, the maximum benefits because your gut microbiome shifts. And in the meantime, sometimes people will experience a little bit of gas and that's considered normal. Don't let that be a deterrent, just let it be good evidence that your body is adapting, your gut flora is kind of changing what its, what its um, specialties are and you're gonna arrive soon. So if there's a little bit of gassiness when you start eating seaweed and you're not used to eating it every day, then just be, um, be surprised and thrilled that you're having a little bit of gas. Yay, it'll be, it'll be temporary. Um, cooking reduces, denatures most of it. So really, I love to take seaweed and, and um, harvest it properly to maintain the beautiful flavor. Um, at the store, sometimes you, you buy seaweed and it just has that wharfy flavor and it's not very very good. Uh, but the way that you dry seaweed and harvest it has a lot of impact on its yumminess. So I just love to have it in a dried form, put it in soups, um, be able to, to put it into salads. The fresher, the better. If you can just go out there on the beach and graze, yay, that's kind of the original way to do it. Um, but the more um, whole and uncooked, unprocessed it is, the more nutrient and uh, constituent content it has. And eating it, of course, but um, yeah, what if you don't really like it? So today here, uh, this is something that um, William, one of the Lummi tribe elders taught me. He said, when my family my family says when the tide is out, the table is set because at low tide, there's just such an abundance of food out there that it's a feast, especially when it's not in the middle of the night or in the middle of a rainstorm or something like that. Um, so these are the, the recipes on the menu today. Um, this is, these are ways that we can incorporate it into a regular diet. So these recipes are yum and they're fun to make. And I, I think I have a lot of different converts that go into the lab not knowing if they're going to really get into it and they walk away um, with the menu all planned out for that month right so if it tastes gross and you're not sure you're a bit apprehensive or you're trying to maybe get your family involved or your your housemates your spouse your parents like whoever you're trying to get somebody to like it that you know would benefit from it but they're not used to it start small. So when you powder it or um, shred it, it kind of disappears into the rest of the flavors. So powdering it and adding it to nutritional yeast and other spices like onion powder and garlic powder, for example, that's a great way to get a lot of seaweed into foods. You can put it on potatoes, on eggs, really. I love popcorn. Um, any way that you can just put that into a spice mix works usually. You can add it to other things that have strong flavors. So I don't know if you cook beans from dried beans, but it's a really easy way to take a big piece of uh, one of the brown kelps and just add that to the bean pot cooking and you'll get a lot in there. Or at the very end, when you're about to serve the chili, sneak in, so crush up some nori, sneak that in. Nobody will notice that. They'll just think it's a little bit richer and deeper of an umami flavor. Um, curries are great as well. Anything that has a strong flavor is generally a great fit for introducing seaweed little by little. But be persistent because you, you remember that your gut flora has to, to shift and change. And as soon as you're optimally processing it in your body, you crave it, you really want it, want it a lot. So, but there is that, you know, adjustment period where you're just not too sure and you might even feel a little queasy or off after because your brain is like, this is a new thing and I'm, I don't know how to really categorize this yet. So I'm going to feel a little nauseous about it, but um, promise me you'll try it at least 10 times, 10 separate times. Allow some synapses in your brain to form before you decide whether or not you really can't have it. And here's just a picture of what it looks like when we're out there and we're bringing home the harvest. And there's different ways to um, dry down different varieties of seaweed for their optimal um, yumminess. Um, so some are on sheets, some are hanging on lines. 
and that is very specific to the type of seaweed. Um, there's one that gets a freshwater rinse, otherwise we would never do that because it would cause a rapid, a rapid degradation to the, uh, to the material and basically it would start to compost right away. Okay, so I want to talk first about minerals. Um, why are seaweed such an essential source of minerals? Well, the reason is that land plants are, you know, different. They're all plants. So seaweeds are actually algae. They're considered algae. They're single-celled organisms that live together in a colony or in a community, much like a coral, but they are considered single-celled algae. Um, on land, of course we have, you know, lots and lots of plants that are able to photosynthesize, but what they're doing is working against air, not water, right? So when they're working against air, they can make sort of a waxy cuticle and they can pump some minerals up into their cells, but it doesn't really take that much work to create a gradient against air and to maintain that, right? They just have to keep, it, keep themselves a bit water, uh, airtight. And if they get dehydrated, you know, they'll wilt a little bit, but now let's think about what the seaweeds have to do in the ocean. They have to maintain a very high mineral gradient to keep turgor pressure inside their cells against ocean water. So if the ocean water is already high in salt and all kinds of minerals, then the seaweed has to be slightly more concentrated in minerals to keep that gradient so that their cells can be plump and full of cytoplasm, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, so if, if your land plants don't have to work that hard, then they simply don't need to have high levels of minerals to, to maintain turgor pressure, but sea vegetables do. So you can take the highest mineral rich land plant, like stinging nettles or something. You know, we, we sing the praises of our brassicas a lot, our kales and, and our, our broccolis and such. Um, but they pale in comparison with the mineral content of sea vegetables, like not even a fifth as much mineral content as the sea vegetables. So that kind of gives you a little bit of freedom in saying that I don't need to have like these massive servings of seaweed to get my minerals. I can get away with like a teaspoon of dried seaweed powder per week. Yeah, that's, it's a very small amount to get the same amount of minerals that you would have to have a huge serving of vegetables on your plate every day. Okay, and we've, you know, we've also got the old debate about our croplands are becoming depleted of trace minerals. Uh, when we go to the ocean, you're gonna find that that is where trace minerals originate, right? And up on land, we kind of have to wait for nutrient cycling to happen and for the parent rock to be um, broken down and um, eroded into bioavailable minerals. So that takes fungus, it takes lichens, it takes weather and acidification. It takes all of this energy to create a mineral bed. And in the farmlands, we're pulling the minerals out faster than nature replenishes them. So it is very true, but go straight to the ocean and that is not going to be the case. Okay. Here's another lovely picture of somebody enjoying their harvest. Yes, you have to just kind of chill out on the beach and relax for a while while your seaweed dries. And what are you gonna do? Nothing, isn't that great? <laughs> isn't that a fun day? Go out to the beach, harvest your seaweed, and then you just have to relax and let it dry. Um, that's my kind of harvest right there. Okay, so um, seaweeds are actually 20 to 50% dry weight minerals. And um, this, is, uh, this is obtained, like this data is obtained by burning the, the material and then separating it out by minerals and then weighing it compared to the original dry weight, right? So we know that some seaweeds are higher in particular minerals than others, but what we know is that the large brown seaweeds like the kelps are going to be higher ounce for ounce in minerals than the red seaweeds like nori. But nori has higher protein content. It also has omega fatty acids and some other things. So um, we're really seeing that um, the brown seaweeds went out uh, in the, the mineral content ounce for ounce, but the red seaweeds have a bit of a broader medicinal effect. 
Okay. More seaweed. I just put pictures of seaweed harvest all through. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so we also, you know, see that seaweeds are concentrating them. So we talked about this a bit, about keeping their ionic, ionic gradient in water. Five to 10 grams of seaweed a day is enough to basically transform most cases of chronic exhaustion. So let's think about this a little bit. For our bodies to function, we need to use proteins in the form of enzymes, right? But enzymes require cofactors. You learned about this in biochem. And if, you know, if you weren't paying attention, it could have just, you know, gone straight over your head or under your nose or whatever you say in one ear out the other. Um, but biochemistry is a code word for nutrition. So all of those cofactors that you were talking about in, in biochem are actually nutrients. Those are minerals. And every enzyme needs some mineral or even more than one mineral sometimes in order to properly do its transfer of energy. So when we have shortages or depleted states of these trace minerals, then we end up not having optimal um, biosynthesis on a lot of levels. So our biochemistry has workarounds. You know, once this pathway has its rate limiting step, well, we can kind of shift and do this alternate pathway, right? But now when, when we're working off of auxiliary resources all the way around, we tend to be very exhausted and depleted and feel restless, anxious, depressed, irritable. Um, our muscles aren't as strong. Um, we can't think as clearly. There's a lot that happens when we're not running optimally. So yeah, that's, that's it's something to consider. So I know that you've probably seen a lot of this stuff on the market, right? You've got alternative salts and people don't wanna do just the, the Morton iodized salt anymore, right? They're looking for um, more sophisticated salts. So Celtic sea salt and other ones, um, they're good source. They say they're good sources of trace minerals, but unfortunately, it really isn't true. So Himalayan sea salt. Let's start with that one. It's chemically similar to table salt, plus it has what's called um, mineral impurities. So it is being mined out of um, ancient glacial deposits in the Himalayan regions. It's something that is considered a non-renewable resource because it's being mined, right? It comes from pretty far away, so there's that too. Um, it is 95 to 98% sodium chloride. So your two to 4% um, leftover is called polyhalite. So two to 4% of that is potassium, calcium, magnesium, sulfur, oxygen, and hydrogen. That's a polyhalite. 0.01% um, fluoride, 0.01% iodine. So really there's mostly just sodium chloride in there. It, it does offer some uh, very, very, very trace levels of these other things, calcium, magnesium, sulfur, oxygen, and potassium, but that's not adequate to replenish your daily intake. It would take an obscene amount of sodium chloride in order to get enough of those other minerals to make a significant difference. Okay, um, what about the Celtic sea salt? So this Celtic gray sea salt, same thing. So it, you know, even though it's well marketed, we're gonna find that it just doesn't have the same levels of trace minerals that, so do, do you scrap it all? Do you just, you know, throw it out and try something different or stop using it, stop buying it? Not necessarily, but it might be worthwhile to take out your Vitamix and put, Put some nice dried kelp in there, powder it down really, really finely, and then add that to your salt. You can just put that right into your salt grinder um, or blend it with your salt and have a little bit more of a fortified salt. So, um, and potassium, you know, just to get a bit of potassium, twist chard, you, you have to have a cup to get a gram of potassium of, of chard. Um, squash, a cup to get one gram of potassium, half a great big avocado, 
will give you a little less than a gram of potassium. Um, half a cup of dried apricots gets you just under a gram. So, you know, you're going to find that um, to get a gram of potassium, you need um, less than a half a teaspoon of powdered kelp. So easy, easy, easy workarounds there. Um, there's a, I know this is lunchtime. Is it unfair to be showing off these? So when we harvest nori, um, wild nori off the rocks, we bring it back and the, the little plate here has the same salmon dish, um, but that was the nori wrapped in these wild nori balloons. We make little balloons out of them and they just pop in your mouth with all this juiciness. We can also use some commercially prepared toasted nori sheets and get the same effect, but the wild one tastes better, just a little bit better. It's my bias. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about potassium. So you need potassium all the time, no exceptions. All cells need potassium. It has um, more salty a taste than salt. It's eight times saltier than sodium. And sometimes you can get it just as pure potassium. It's very fine, fine powder. And it just saturates your tongue with saltiness. And if you take a, a dried piece of kelp frond and you dry it crisp in the sun and you just let that melt in your mouth, that is the flavor of potassium. It just saturates your tongue and melts out. Um, so what do you need potassium for? Um, what do you think? So a lot of people complain about having salt cravings, especially during certain times of the month or um, certain times of the day. So if you, if you feel like you're constantly having salt cravings, and even though you eat a lot of salty foods, like maybe you like some pretzels or chips or popcorn or something like that, and it just seems like every day you are craving salt again, then I would highly suspect that you are potassium deficient. So usually these people have, tend to hold wa like water in their tissues, so they're a bit puffy and edemic, and they complain of exhaustion. Um, try taking a supplement of powdered seaweed. Almost any seaweed will work and every day up to 10 grams a day and symptoms will resolve within a month. So I haven't encountered any potassium toxicity by doing this. And you know, when we get to toxicity, um, there's actually some good evidence that high levels or high intakes of seaweed are more protective than you would think. So high levels of seaweed, the only element that I worry about with that is getting too much iodine. So anytime that there is cravings for salt, um, even in pregnancy, um, in people who have a hard time concentrating and focusing, um, feeling restless, uh, twitching and tapping and fidgeting, um, these are all signs that there's low potassium status. So there's also a pretty wonderful effect on um, folks who have PMS in a pretty severe way. So PMS can be a combination of uh, fluid retention plus some interesting food cravings, restlessness, irritability. And so once you incorporate seaweed, you might notice that all of those symptoms diminish. Here's another yummy recipe. Who likes to make um, tuna sandwiches or tuna melts or something in their secret family recipe that has pickles in there? Well, try putting bull kelp in there instead or anytime you would use pickles in a relish, um, this works wonders. So everybody loves these bull kelp pickles. It seems like most people don't even know that they're kelp and not pickles. So you can cut them into O's, you can make them into julienne spears, there's a lot of different ways to make them and they're shelf stable, easy to gift. And yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a, like a winning thing when you make a huge batch of it. Okay, so I alluded to iodine. Let's talk about iodine because it's pretty important. Um, maybe the single most important ele element that's provided by seaweeds. So everybody needs um, iodine. All vertebrates, I should say, need iodine. So iodine is used to make thyroid hormones, um, especially T4, thyroxin, and T3, triiodothyronine, 
and that controls field development and postnatal um, cognitive development and helps with basically all of your daily metabolism. So if you don't have any iodine, then you are not able to make these thyroid hormones and you are not able to sustain vertebrate life. So sometimes people say they're allergic to iodine. They're not allergic to iodine. They're probably allergic to all of the rest of the things that are in that iodine preparation because it would not be compatible with being live to be truly allergic to iodine as an element. Okay, so um, 60 parts per billion was kind of like the, the right amount when people lived by the sea, that would be a daily intake. Um, so once people migrated inland and stopped having sea vegetables and seafoods, iodine became a major challenge. So major challenge for um, learning and having good cognitive function. I, you know, iodine is one of those things that without it, um, there's major birth defects. And then without it, you also make some colloid buildup in the thyroid causing a goiter. So um, even a tiny amount of iodine per day is enough to uh, protect you from having goiter. So does it have just iodine? Well, no, it actually, the seaweed has a lot more than iodine depending on the type of seaweed. So kelp, contains the highest levels of iodine than any food on the planet. And if you have one serving of kelp, then you have 200 micrograms of iodine or 2000 micrograms of iodine, excuse me. And we didn't need that much. So you need far less to be okay um, day to day. So wakame is actually um, also wonderful source. You'll see that in salads, etc. But I wanna sing the praises a little bit of um, that fucus for iodine. So fucus vesiculosis, uh, we'll talk, it's later on in the slideshow is a picture of fucus vesiculosis. It looks like a little thyroid gland the way it's shaped. So it's, it's this little seaweed that grows on the rocks in the intertidal zone. And there are a lot of different species of it. So there's vesiculosis, there's also disticus. There are some endangered species of fucus too. So you wanna be careful about um, being able to key it out if you're wild harvesting it and use scissors so that you leave the stipe on the rock and it will regrow. But this particular one has been used to treat low thyroid function. And it used to be that we thought it was just all about the iodine because it is a brown seaweed and well, it is high in iodine, but we've actually learned that people don't tend to eat it, like chew it up, but you know, and it's kind of a tough one and it's not the most flavorful one. Um, but they would put it in broths and they'd put it in um, food. So when, look, when taking a closer look at fucus, it was found that it does actually contain T4. So it, it, it contains T4, but that is not water soluble. That is, an, it's in an oil soluble form. So it needs to be extracted in something that has some oil in, oiliness in it. So uh, yeah, we could do that in seal fat, right? Um, in that stew, in that soup or that stew. If it had meats, it ha also had oiliness and the, the fucus would impart the flavor of the sea, but you would also end up extracting thyroid hormone in addition to the iodine. Fucus also contains, and all brown seaweeds do, um, high levels of tyrosine. So tyrosine, along with iodine, there are both needed in order to make thyroid hormone. So it doesn't just work to take an iodine supplement to support the thyroid, because that's not all, that, not all that's helping your thyroid out. So um, consider seaweed a restorative food or a medicine that should be infused in fat for treating low thyroid function, allowing for the, the normalization of low thyroid function. So what I usually do is take fucus and put it in, you know, it's usually dried fucus and I'll put that in an olive oil or a ghee or a coconut oil, um, depending on who the person is and what they prefer. And I'll also throw in some ashwagandha root, also dry 
And I'll put that in a double boiler or be able to do that oil infusion long and low and slow. So for about um, two days, I'll infuse that fucus and the ashwagandha into the oil. And then that's their new oil, right? That's their new cooking oil that they cook everything with. Um, and it's, it's pretty powerful stuff. It seems to taste pretty darn good too. All right, so here is another dish to consider, fragrant nori rice. So yes, take the zest and juice of an orange, some basmati quick cooking rice, and go ahead and toss it all together with some celery, garlic, hazelnuts, cranberries, a granny cementa apple, some nori flakes, and um, yeah, nori powder. We <laughs> just put a lot of seaweed in there. The seaweed actually works so well with the apples, the crunchy celery, the cranberries, it all works. So give that one a try. I have yet to meet someone that doesn't absolutely love this rice. And if you didn't tell them that it had seaweed in it, they probably wouldn't know. Um, not that you should ever lie to whoever's eating your food or withhold information, but hey, if they're not into seaweed, then they might, they wouldn't notice that that was in there. Okay, so back to iodine. Um, if, if you're worried about the radioactive part, of iodine. Well, we actually have two very large cohort studies. <laughs> the first cohort study is called Chernobyl, right? So um, close to 40 years ago, so two generations ago, when Chernobyl had the massive meltdown and it was the, the single worst um, nuclear disaster in the, in the planet's history, um, it really adversely affected the thyroid health of a lot of people, a lot of people and their children and their children's children are still continuing to suffer from um, birth defects relating to thyroid. Um, I think it was the first generation and the second generation that had the highest incidence of thyroid cancer ever before seen. So we know that when radioactive iodine is uptaken into the body, and then it is uptaken into the thyroid gland, it does cause thyroid cancer very rapidly. Now about, oh goodness, I guess it's, has it been nine years? Um, when Fukushima um, had the disaster. So that is another really big cohort study. So now we can compare two very serious disasters, um, both of them involving the dusting of entire cities with iodine-131 every day following that disaster. So what happened in Chernobyl is you have a bunch of landlocked people that do not traditionally eat seaweed in their diets. So having a low iodine diet to begin with, um, you introduce radioactive iodine settling in on the plants, settling in the air, it's in, becoming ingested in any way, going to go straight to the thyroid and stay there. Now, if you have uh, the other cohort who has been eating seaweed every day all their lives and uh, isn't going to stop eating seaweed, um, even though the seaweed was hot, the seaweed had a radioactive charge, their, their thyroid glands did not uptake the radioactive iodine. So we also know that there's a pretty relatively short half-life for iodine-131. So after all of the debris that washed up on shore in California was um, measured with a Geiger counter and found to be radioactive, um, they continuously measured, um, they came back every day and measured it and they found that in about three months, the radioactive charge had diminished down to unpercept unperceivable levels. And what happened in Japan is that people were checking their groceries before bringing them in the house with Geiger counters. And they were, it was unsafe to eat those foods for a long time, um, but now they're okay. And so are the seaweeds that came out just right around that region. So this is all good news, right? So in, uh, in a nuclear disaster, do we avoid eating seaweed? or do we eat as much seaweed as we can find? The answer is please eat as much seaweed as you can find every day and feed it to your children and make sure that everybody has an adequate supply of seaweed. 
I worry a lot about the folks over in Ukraine and what they could be facing real soon. So it wouldn't hurt if you um, have family or friends in Ukraine to share that with them. Okay, uh, here's another recipe to consider, potatoes. So uh, usually when we think about seaweed cuisine, we're thinking um, Asian cuisine, but I wanna remind you that in, uh, in Scotland and in Wales, there's a very rich culture of eating seaweed. So this is a recipe that comes straight from Wales. Um, so making your new potatoes with butter, lemon, and sea lettuce. So sea lettuce is a really great one that has a very delicate flavor. It's very easy to find and it stays that fiber bright green color. Okay, sorry my phone rang. Okay, um, let's talk about one more mineral that you'll find in very low amounts, um, selenium. So selenium is something that impairs thyroid hormone metabolism. Um, or excuse me, the deficiency impairs thyroid hormone metabolism. So you need selenium in order for all of the rest of the things to work properly. But unfortunately, that's why this picture shows selenium in a little straight jacket. It is not available in seaweed. So not only does it have very low amounts, but it isn't uptaken from seaweed very well. So we do need to have selenium from another source. So if you make selenium um, the, the solution for your, or if you, if you make seaweed the solution from, for your anxiety, your PMS, your depression, your fatigue, your edema, all that, and your thyroid um, hypofunction, then you definitely need to find good sources of selenium. Now, this is something that's usually not a problem for most people, but just in case, you know, check it out. You're gonna get your selenium from beans and eggs. One Brazil nut per day is about the amount that you need for your adequate intake. Um, it's in fish and in beef. Um, so just if this seems to not be at all in your, in your diet, then it's worth making note of to include. So selenium definitely is necessary to convert T4 to T3 and to become active in the body. Okay, so what about these other toxic metals, toxic trace metals? Well, I have good news about this too. So um, there was a pretty, pretty nice study that showed that arsenic in seaweed is in really high amounts. <laughs> so we have allowable levels in grains, vegetables, and meats. You can have 0 0.01 to one milligram per kilogram. That's the limit. But in seaweed, guess what? it's 10 to 60 milligrams per kilogram. That's how much arsenic is in seaweed. Oh my goodness. So this, this kind of um, is a problem, right? There's a huge high level of arsenic than, than in vegetables and meats. But why it's good news is because in seaweed, the arsenic is actually a normal mineral that seaweed requires and it exists in a form called arseno sugars. So these arseno sugars are able to be broken down in your body into a bunch of different metabolites. And these metabolites, they go out in the urine. And not only that, but when in the process of digesting seaweed, it tends to find arsenic in the body and drag that out too, it bonds to it. So you can take seaweed in that has this really high level of arsenic and then end up excreting more than what you ate, more arsenic. And so they figured this out by um, taking, uh, I believe it was 11 volunteers and um, had them each eat 10 grams of seaweed every day. And they had to abstain from some other things that could skew the data, et cetera but they collected their urine and tested their urine for arsenic and arsenic metabolites. And what they found was that the amount of arsenic going in to their body was less than the amount of arsenic exiting their body. So even though it had high arsenic burden up front, like we should be afraid of it, it turned out that it was helping the detox function of removing arsenic from their bodies. So that was excellent news, right? There's another study that Huang did in Korea looking at arsenic, mercury, lead, and cadmium. 
So they looked at all these different Korean um, commonly eaten seaweeds and they found that the levels vary widely amongst like the different coastal regions where they're harvested and that none of them were, were high in the humans who regularly ate it. So they looked at the, the levels of the metals in the seaweed and then they analyzed the humans that routinely ate it and found that they did not have tissue levels that were accumulating in their body. So even when the, ver the levels were varying between um, harvesting in very filthy areas or very clean areas. And another study came out by Rubio. Um, they looked at 20 different metals using the ICP OES um, machine that basically measures levels of heavy metals. Um, they, com they compared Asian seaweed with European seaweed. And then they also compared it between um, conventional seaweed farm cultivation practices versus organic. And they thought they would have like this really wide range of differences. And they found that, yeah, there were differences, but all the seaweed they tested happened to be within safe limits. So this was good information for me to find because in, during my pregnancy, I craved seaweed. I wanted to have seaweed. I knew it would help me with all kinds of pregnancy related symptoms. And then I was afraid that it, I might be having too much mercury or I might be having too much arsenic for a developing fetus. And when I, when I read this data, I was delighted to find that actually um, the, there's a the big conflict out there in um, the recommendations because they look at just the values in the seaweed before it, but looking closer at the research, you'll find that there's no evidence to support discontinuing seaweed during pregnancy. Yay. Okay, um, here's another one for you. We have our crostinis with Chev and nori and a little cracked salt finish over the top. They're so yummy. Um, are you gonna come seaweed with me? Okay, um, we also have a whole collection of um, different polysaccharides called alginates or phycopolymers. And now all seaweeds contain a large proportion, like about 25 to 40% of of the plant material by weight is mucopolysaccharides and they're called phycopolymers. The brown algaes have the highest of fucoidin, which is a sulfated galactin and algin is one of them. So algin has a therapeutic value, uh, value for detoxifying heavy metals. So when we take it as uh, an ingredient in a detox formula or as a, a compound um, in a supplement, it usually comes as algin powder or sodium alginate is another name for it. But the purpose behind adding that to a supplement is to simply bind heavy metals that are present in the food stream and make sure that they are bound and excreted via the stool. So usually this is coming, you know, that it's through the bile acids. So if you eat your food and you excrete the bile, it sticks to the algin and continues its way out the alimentary canal. So this is, this is good, good, right? Um, but taking it in algin powder or sodium alginate for the function of detox isn't necessary to do that in such a processed and prepared way. Eating the seaweed um, as a whole food or even as a powder in your spices uh, will accomplish this task in a daily manner, a small incremental on a daily basis. Um, it is not a digestible fiber and it doesn't tend to uh, be a provocative detox. So it's just simply whatever can go in the bile and whatever is in that, that um, meal's burden is going to bind to the algin and exit the body. So, um, it's also used in food science. So in this picture, they've basically taken cheese and coated it in algin. So you reconstitute the alginate and you coat it in algin 
and then you put it in a, a little deep fryer and it makes this crispy bubble that then with your fork, you crack it and it just melts out. And it's like this amazing um, cool trick for, for a chef to put together, right? Okay, so Fukuiden is another one that we have quite a lot of research on. So Fukuiden, there's a picture of the, the polysaccharide structure. Um, it's really high in brown algae like kelp. So it can be really easily cooked out of it by just taking dried kelp, throwing it in a bath of hot water and simmering it for about 20 to 40 minutes. And it will kind of disintegrate and go into the food or into the broth or what have you. It'll give it a little bit of a texture. But when it's consumed, um, it reduces the inflammatory response and it promotes rapid tissue healing. And this was measured after wound trauma as well as surgical trauma. So it's recommended after any sort of um, tissue trauma, sports injuries, falls, muscle and joint damage. Um, yeah, pretty much anything, surgery, anything. So brown seaweed, your kelps, you can accomplish this three to five grams a day. Um, you can cook it as a vegetable broth, add that to your bone broth, add that to uh, make a broth and make your rice with it or whatever. Just get that fucoidin in to help with tissue repair. Um, there's, a, there's a whole nother branch of research that looks specifically on its antiviral work. So fucoidin interferes with basically every stage of viral attack including cell attachment, cell penetration, and intercellular virin production because it stimulates antiviral cytokines. So um, there may be some suppression uh, directly attaching to the virus as, as well. Um, so the, the most common viral uh, infestations that it has been measured on have been HIV and HPV and the family of herpes virus. So what's interesting is that fucoidin has its terminal sugar, is an original sugar unique to this particular seaweed called fucose or brown seaweeds, um, fucose. Um, all human cells that were studied in vitro had a fucose receptor site on their surfaces. So there could be sort of this co-evolution between humans and seaweeds that um, it's, a, it's a form of recognition that these cells have a fucose receptor site and respond by becoming um, resistant to viral attack. Cool stuff, huh? Um, okay, let's talk about this one, Kerginin, which is agar. So this one comes from red algae. So red algal, algal polymers um, are basically agar and carrageenan. And mainly um, in nori, it's porphyron. But they're all sulfated galactins that are water soluble. They're partially digestible. And really, you can easily extract them out of the seaweed by boiling it. So throwing um, a piece of red seaweed into your soup will impart this wonderful polysaccharide. So dulse Irish moss tends to be really mucoid and kind of like a thickener of sorts. Um, some people have a bit of an aversion to those thick kind of mucoid type textures. Um, but I found that one really good way to do it is to make a cough syrup or even make a jello out of it. Um, Oh, one time we tried to make a cough syrup and it turned out to be a jello and it was a big win. I fed it to my kids and they wanted more and more and more of this stuff. So we just called them cough jellies, cough jellies. And they were uh, elder, uh, it was elderberry plus some other herbs um, it made into this, this carrageen or this uh, agar based jelly and turns out to be an amazing anti-inflammatory um, expectorant that's antiviral. So commonly we'll use 
this as a respiratory application since it's a reflex demulcent and it helps to moisten the respiratory surfaces and help with the quality of um, mucus. So also, uh, you know, used topically on herpes lesions, also anti-HIV, and there is a contraceptive gel or personal lubricant that is based, um, seaweed, carrageenan base, that actually was shown without any added ingredients, just the base of that was anti-HIV. Pretty awesome. Okay, so I do have to highlight though that some people have become sensitized to carrageenan because it's been overutilized in food science. So it's in your almond milk, it's in your ice cream, it's in your condiments, it's in everything. It's even in breads as a dough conditioner. So really people have started reacting to it with an inflammatory way. So um, there is a little bit of data to support that if you have an inflammatory condition that is aggravated by carrageenan, avoid it, avoid it. Or if you have an inflammatory bowel condition, really like ulcerative colitis is, a, is an excellent example. Avoid carrageenan in your daily life. And then you can use it during an acute flare as a, a digestive demulcent and to help support healing but you don't want to overdo it between flares. So there's um, a bit of a strategy behind it, but um, people who have had a lot of carrageenan and have begun to react to carrageenan with GI inflammation need to really watch out. Okay, a little more seaweed there. And I need to wrap it up in a few minutes here, but I do have to tell you that there are naturally occurring hormones also in seaweeds. So melatonin is abundant in many plants and very high in seaweeds, up to a thousand times the amounts found in land plants. So feverfew and St. John's wort contain uh, small amounts of melatonin, seaweed contains a lot. So some people report having sort of a relaxing and calming effect after eating seaweeds and we can chalk that up to the minerals or we can also recognize that there are significant levels of melatonin in it. And when the seaweed is harvested at night, it has a higher content of melatonin than daytime harvested seaweed. Pretty cool. Um, thyroid hormones in seaweed. So we talked about this a little bit in the fucus, but um, many brown seaweeds also have this going on. So make sure that you are extracting it in a lipid, um, preparation um, in an oil extraction, of course. And remember that uh, there's also tyrosine in there. It's kind of fun to see some hormones in seaweed that help directly support our mental and metabolic health. Uh, we also have essential fatty acids and vitamins in seaweeds. So most seaweeds are really rich in vitamins, especially B vitamins, including B12. Although there is some controversy about how absorbable it is um, for humans, but there's also up to one to 3% of omega fatty acids in, especially in the red seaweeds, but nori in particular has 3% omega-3 fatty acids plus large amounts of vitamins A and C. So this is really good news for vegans that are trying to find good sources of omega fatty acids it's got it all. So um, learn how to get nori yourself or um, find the sources that you trust and go for it. Have as much as you want. Some people even consider powdered fucus mixed with olive oil as a quality vegan replacement for cod liver oil. Okay, so I do want to just give you a little confidence here. Which seaweeds are edible? Well, all of them, but some are really tough and some taste terrible. Um, some even, yeah, can taste like bleach or rotten eggs or yucky. I mean, if it's completely aversive, do not, don't force it. But if you sniff it out you and it, it smells good to you, I want you to know that it is very safe and you can go out there to the sea and just sort of pick a little bit off the rock and sneak a little taste straight out of the ocean without doing anything. And that's normal. 
that's humans have been doing that for thousands and thousands and thousands of years and really relying on it for sustaining their health. Um, this one here, or this picture right here uh, to the far right bottom, that is not a seaweed. That's, that's rocket, that's beach rocket. Goes really well with seaweed, but it's not a seaweed. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna go over to the end. Here's my sunset picture. And open it up if you would like to ask some questions. In the I chat. Do. Oh, oh yeah, go ahead, go ahead and ask your question and then I'll look at the chat. I was just gonna say, I saw some questions in the chat. So I thought maybe I would ask those for you. Um, yeah. Just scanning. Um, Libby asked, do you have a personal preference towards Himalayan versus Celtic sea salt if you were going to choose one? You know, you know what just happened? My little brother got back from Kona and he went on a salt tour and he found this deep sea salt from Kona that they're harvesting at like 20,000 feet under the ocean. And it is so good. And it's really, really high in potassium, like 30% potassium. So I really, if I'm gonna go for my favorite salt, I like that. Otherwise, I really am kind of a sucker for those um, smoked salts, like an alder smoked salt as a finishing salt. But I generally don't use salt unless it's on an heirloom tomato or something like that. Um, because we really, we don't crave it. And when I salt foods, my kids are up drinking water all night. If, if they go to a pizza party or something like that, then it's like, okay, we're all gonna be up chugging water all night <laughs> and having to pee. So really, I think salt is something that you adapt to. And if you crave a lot of salt, then try cutting it with some seaweed or incorporating more seaweed in and see if that salt craving changes. Um, yeah, one bag of salt, like a pound of salt will probably last us about five years in our house. That's um, such an interesting perspective on salt because I know for so many people it's so common, but we have seaweed teas instead. I love it. Um, and then Hannah asks, so she often boils kombu seaweed when she's making pasta or rice to remineralize. Is this something you've heard of and do you feel like it's a good source of remineralization? Yeah, you betcha. So with pasta though, usually you cook it and then you dump it down the drain except for the noodles, right? So hopefully you are um, not using as much water as is usually called for so that most of those minerals are, you know, staying in the pasta. But in rice, absolutely. I always do that. It's a good way to go. Awesome, thank you. And then... Ellie's asking how you're harvesting the seaweed. Do you just go to the beach and pick it up? What's washed up? Or are you actively going into the water and pulling it out of the ocean? Yeah, great question. Um, look at the tide charts and make sure that you're going for the lowest tide. The best places to go are the ones with the highest species diversity. So diversity is really what's gonna save us in the long run. When we start to see these areas that are losing diversity and you only see like one type or it all just looks kind of muddy brown, um, that's not gonna be a very clean site. That's usually a very polluted site. So mm -hmm. go somewhere that has lots of vibrant colors of different types of seaweed, go at low tide and you bet, go out there and get it. You can use scissors or your fingernail to tear it off close to the rock without taking the hold fast and it will grow back. Some places require a permit. Some places have particular seasons. Um, and then some places have like smelt eggs or protected species that are mixed in. So you wanna kind of know what you're doing and it wouldn't hurt to get a good local seaweed guide for your area, but please feel comfortable doing it. Um, I also vet my sources if I buy seaweed pretty carefully because not that I'm worried about the heavy metals or the polluted product, but I worry about their practices in harvest and if they are protecting the health of the sea, because that is really key, that the companies that depend on those seaweeds need to be stewarding the health of that sea. So Blue Dot is a wonderful company. Um, up at, in Washington, we have something called Pacific Rim. It's a great source. 
um, just make sure that you vet the quality of the company. And sometimes, you know, I, I do shop a lot at the Korean grocery store because I eat a lot of kimchi. <laughs> um, but whenever I go for the seaweed, it just says seaweed as the ingredients. And I, it doesn't tell me what species or where it came from or anything. So um, some of the international markets don't have any regulation. It doesn't mean it's a bad company. It just means that it's a big question mark. So you sort of answered the next, next question, but it was if you have any recommended brands. Um, and along those lines, I was going to ask if one, you're willing to share your slides. And if so, if you have a list of recommended brands, maybe we could um, send that out as well for students um, just to get them started on looking for those reputable brands. Yeah, you know, I, I don't really have a list uh, here I can come full screen here. I don't have a list of recommended brands necessarily, but I, I could probably come up with it. And absolutely, I'm happy to share my slides. Awesome. Thank you. And then I personally had one other question. I've heard that you usually host um, a seaweed elective. Do you know what quarter that usually happens so that students can Cali from California, if it's open to us so that we can look out for it? February. <laughs> so February. yeah, like usually it's late February or early March and it's a weekend elective. So the Friday evening is on Zoom and it's a lot like what we talked about today, but in much greater detail and um, more species identification. And otherwise, yeah, it's in winter. We used to do it in summer, but that's actually a protected time of year for the Salish Sea. So we would have to be doing it illegally. And, oh, Liberty, you signed up last year and they told me you couldn't take it, huh? Well, that would be a quick trip from San Diego up and back, but we'll see if we can get you in this year. That would be awesome. I'm also super interested. So if we can, um, I can also work to see who to contact um, to try to get it open to California students. Um, Definitely after this talk, I'm so fascinated to go harvest and yeah. learn more about this process. Um, so yeah, thank you. Yeah, so we much. do it in, in the winter time, but then in the summertime, I usually put together a group of you know students that just want to go on a harvesting trip with me, and it's more of just like a casual car camping experience where we can just hang out and dry down our seaweed and have fun. And that's I I think that's what students need more than more electives is they just need times to just go and have fun. That does sound like a lot of fun. Um, I'd also be interested in if it's open to California students potentially um, advertising that to the students who um, came to our talk today. Yeah, I, I think so. I'll have to double check with our registrar and see what the rationale was behind Liberty not being able to get in other than maybe it was a full, I don't know. I don't know, but we'll see what we can figure out because it's a wonderful skill to have to go out and get your own seaweed every year year and um, just make it part of a normal life. So I love having my kids be comfortable on the beach and they they know their way around and they love eating seaweed. And, you know, even my, my first grader went to school a few weeks ago. She had to do show and tell, bring a me bag. What about me? And she's like, mom, I have to show them seaweed. <laughs> okay. So it's, it's important part of who she is. It's her identity. <laughs> but I love that. Well, thank you very much. Um, it was enjoyable and just let me know anytime you have any questions. And should I email you my slides then, Ryan? That would be great if you could email me and we will have, we'll post the recording on um, our club YouTube page. And I just send that out to the students who are on our um, BotMed Club mailing list. So we'll get the slides right. out to those students as well. Sounds good, thank you. Thank you so much, so nice to see you. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.